the it sounded like it was a huge pop because now you had all four members of the Bullet Club right there. But anyway, uh, getting to the new day uh, against Gallows and Anderson. Good matchup, and, you know, definitely New Day looked a little stronger than Kofi did in his <laughs> match against Gallows um, a few, about a week or two ago, but definitely a good match. Jon Stewart, you know, he did his thing, you know, not a lot of people like the fact that he's there, but, uh, heck, he got a, he, did, he got a kind of a reaction when he came out like, hey, get the hell out of here, we don't want you here, you're taking up time. But anyway, the uh, tag team match was okay. Uh, Gallus and Anderson win by disqualification because during the match, just when it looked like they were going to take out uh, John Stewart, Gallus and Anderson give him the same thing they did to Big E. Surprise, surprise, Big E shows up. Big E shows up, which I think a lot of us expected him to. Comes out, basically decimates both Gallus and Anderson. And New Day, they lose the match, but they retain their tag team titles. And I guess that's what happens when you have the top selling merchandise in WWE. You want to keep your top sellers on top. But this kind of tells me that Gallus and Anderson are going to get a rematch. Maybe tonight on Raw or at Clash of Champions. And they're going to win those tag team titles. Because either they don't win them. Because if they don't win them, I should say. Then it looks like WWE is planning to have <laughs> New Day not just surpass Brian Kendrick and Paul London's reign. But they're probably planning if something doesn't go wrong. For them to surpass Demolition's reign. So we'll just have to wait and see on that. But yeah, New Day ends up retaining their tag team titles. Next matchup of the night. John Cena, AJ Styles. Whew, what can I say about this match? Classic all the way. No doubt about it. Probably one of the best matches John Cena has had. Against one of these so-called indie darlings. Someone I have met personally. And I'll show you a picture of that if I can find the link. Ink that I've met personally, I've talked to personally. Heck, he's the <laughs> funny story. Like I've said before, he called me the man with a thousand questions when I took a photo when I did my photo opportunity. I uh, took a, a picture with him uh, at the CSW event in Lawrence, Kansas. But anyway, but anyway, AJ Styles, John Cena, great match, no doubt about it. Both men pulled out a lot of arsenals that they, we've seen before, we haven't seen before. I mean, John Cena, basically the surprise of a lot of people, pulled out a freaking Canadian Destroyer, or a modified Canadian Destroyer, on AJ Styles. So that was pretty interesting. It was more like a, a flip, a flipping, it was more, it was, it was more of a Canadian power, more of a flipping power bomb than a, more like a Destroyer power bomb is what it was. But it was modified, like I said. Uh, but great matchup between the two, no doubt about it. Uh, new, I mean, AJ Styles kicking out of the Super AA or the Avalanche AA off the top or second rope was surprising. Uh, John Cena kicking out of the Styles Clash was surprising. And even the Phenomenal Forearm was surprising. So just great match overall. I mean, these guys really tore the house down. And in the end, AJ Styles, he ends up hitting a Styles Clash. He ends up getting out, because it looks like he's out on his feet. John's like, you know, and this is after he hits the Super AA, right? So John's like, because he can't believe, you know, AJ kicked out. He's, John's like this, he gets back up like, whoa, what the? You know, after he does that, he gets right back up and he just goes right to the corner. He's like, what the heck am I dealing with? So basically he says, you know, so basically John having mercy, he's like, okay, I'm just going to hit the AA and that's it. Instead, Styles reverses it into the Styles Clash. Then goes to, and then realizing this is his last opportunity, goes straight to the other side of the ring, hits the phenomenal forearm, gets the one, two, three, and finally gets a clean pinfall victory over John Cena. But here's the one thing people have to understand: this is not the first time John Cena has put over an indie darling at SummerSlam. Several years ago, he did the same for Daniel Bryan. The reason being is this: because these are guys that he looks at. A lot and in agreement with people like Vince McMahon and Triple H. These are guys that John Cena looks at and says, "These are the ones that if I ever have to step away from this company for good or step away from this business for good, I can depend on to carry this company. I can depend on to always be here to give the fans what they want." 
And that's exactly what I think happened here with AJ. He basically passed the torch, in a sense, to AJ. That was the thing about him setting the armband down in the ring. Basically, it was an indication of he never gave up, AJ never gave up, and it's basically a passing of the torch. He's not leaving, he'll be back on SmackDown, but it's more like his way of saying, I'm passing the torch to AJ Styles. You know, here it is, here's the ball, run with it. So, it's going to be real interesting to see the interaction between the two at SmackDown. Next match of the night, of course, was the WWE uh, World Heavyweight Championship match between Dolph Ziggler, Dean Ambrose. It was okay. It was uh, very decent in a sense. Basically, Dolph did everything he could, pulled out his usual st uh, stuff along with some new stuff. But it was a little, you could tell Dolph was a little bit more aggressive here. here. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, again, though, very good. I liked how Ambrose was kind of like being nonchalant about it, like, yeah, you know, man, you can do all this stuff, but I'm just going to come here, do what I usually do, and go out and win. And <laughs> that's what he did. Ambrose ended up uh, winning uh, the match by blocking the top rope uh, uh, X-Factor, if you will, or head smash. And basically tossing Dolph off, and as Dolph's running towards him, he basically is able to... Uh, uh, hook him into basically the Dirty Deeds and gets the win uh, right then and there. So, yeah, Dean Ambrose keeping the championship. Obviously, it could lead to a rematch on SmackDown Live, maybe Backlash, but a lot of people penciling AJ to be the next challenger. I would expect that to be before Backlash, not SmackDown Live. Next match on the card. And maybe the... Next match on the card, and maybe I got the match thing uh, mix, uh, mixed up there. Uh, next match on the card was the women, I think it was. Because I think it would be hard for them to follow uh, the other match. Well, maybe not, I don't know. But uh, one, of the matches, one of the next matches on the card was a six-woman tag team match between in the SmackDown Live women on one side you had Becky Lynch, Carmella, and Naomi. On the other side you had Natalia, Alexa Bliss, and Eva Marie. Well, not exactly. The way they did it though was great. Uh, basically, they had the announcement and everything, and as soon as they, you know, as soon as the announcer, her personal announcer, finished up his thing, like saying, you know, all saying this usual stick, he says, Eva Marie is exhausted is feeling exhausted from all the fan interaction, da da da, and will be taking leave in the, taking a vacation in the British Isles. So basically, they found a way to write her off in the next month or so. But who does to take her place? None other than John Cena's woman, Nikki Bella. That's right, Nikki Bella, she comes back, gets a huge reaction from the fans, and it's because, you know, apparently they want to see her back. Uh, but she plays the heel here, so, you know, she did get a little bit more, that fanfare she got kind of went down a little bit. She did get a little bit more booze and all that because she was on the heel team, being a little heelish. But being the returning star that she is, she ends up getting the win, especially with the fact that they got a new reality show called Total Bellas coming out on E, which I'm sure a lot of people are excited for. <laughs> but she ends up getting the win with a modified version of the Rack Attack which is now a TKO, because I think maybe that's what the doctors told her, is you can't do the rack attack anymore, that's going to hurt your neck, do something else, and she just hits a TKO now. So yeah, Nikki Bella ends up winning the match for her team. It was an okay six-woman tag, and it's something you could usually probably have seen on SmackDown Live, had it not been for the fact that she was coming back, Nikki Bella was coming back. And again, what surprised me was this was pushed off of the pre-show onto the main card, and such, on a high pedestal on the main card, but then again, when you're the girlfriend of John Cena, as some people might say, you get what you want. Uh, next matchup, uh, next matchup we had uh, that night was for to crown the first ever Universal Champion between Seth Rollins and, of course, uh, Finn Balor. And first of all, let me just say this. When I saw the Universal Championship, there was a lot of reports that it was just going to be what you see with the, uh, uh, the WWE cha Championship and Women's Championship. The only difference 
is it's going to be a red strap, red in the middle, and it's going to say Universal Champion on the bottom, and that's exactly what it was. I know a lot of people complain that it's not a unique design, and I get that. I totally do, but I think what WWE is trying to do is they're trying to cater to that hardcore smart fan base, but they're also trying to cater to that sports fan base. And there's those sporting outlets like ESPN and everything. But anyway, a Finn Balor against Seth Rollins, great matchup here uh, between the two. I know some people felt that it was a little off because their styles don't gel. You gotta realize that they may have, you gotta realize that even though people were played up as though they've never faced each other, I'm pretty sure that when they were Tyler Black and Prince Devitt, they faced off against each other somewhere in the independent scene. That's pretty much a given. I think what it was is they just haven't faced each other for so long and the styles had changed a little bit throughout the careers that that's why it felt a little off. But anyway, decent match here, very good match. And surprisingly, in the end, um, Seth Rollins does not win. Yeah, Seth Rollins, which a lot of people, even myself, would think would win, did not win. Instead, it was Finn Balor. Finn Balor becomes uh, the Universal Champion and becomes the second man to not only be the NXT Champion, but, the Univer but a World Champion on the main roster but a WWE champion on the main roster but what's funny though is I don't think they've acknowledged this but hopefully they will he's going to be the first man Finn Balor to be to lose an NXT championship but become a WWE world champion all within the same year yeah he lost it remember he lost the NXT title to Samoa Joe at a house show right never got it back even in the demon persona but he ends up becoming WWE World Champion two months after his last opportunity at the NXT title. So that's, that's pretty much saying how, pretty much giving him high praise and how much the company values him. But yeah, Finn Balor does end up becoming champion. He is the Universal Champion. How long will he keep the title? We don't know. A lot of people were saying he was injured, but it didn't look like that according to a lot of people. It might have been just a stinger. He didn't look like he was that injured. You know, usually when you get a stinger or something like that, you start losing feeling a little bit, and you want to kind of do this with your arm a little bit, let it kind of get the blood, uh, you know, pulsing back in or something like that. But yeah, Finn Balor uh, ends up winning the championship, much to the surprise of a lot of people. Uh, will they play the? Now, here's the question a lot of people have: Will they play the club into the scenario? We don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Next matchup of the night, though, and this was a surprise of how high up it was. I mean, showing that it would, and, and I know a lot of people question this because it shows that the WWE, that the WWE, they still could, they still have Roman on a high pedestal in a lot of fans' opinion because his match was above the Universal Title match. His match was above the WWE World Title match. His match with Rusev was the second to last match of the night, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't really much of a match. Mainly, it was more of a brawl. Uh, Rusev attacked Roman as he was getting into the ring. Bell never really sounded. It just went all over the place. Uh, both men beating the crap out of each other until Roman got the better of the situation and literally started to beat the crap out of uh, out of Rusev. F and everything until officials had to pull him off. off. But Roman wasn't done yet because when it looked like Rusev was going to be able to walk on his own accord, Roman comes back out and says, screw that shit. Excuse my language, God, but says screw that shit and basically ends up spearing, and again, excuse my language, God, uh, spearing um, Rusev on, does basically his running spear, his flying spear onto Rusev. So obviously they're going to have another match at Clash of Champions, maybe some with a stipulation or something like that. Of course, then that leads us to our main event Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar. Uh, it was okay, mostly all Brock, Brock Lesnar, almost similar to his match with John Cena. But Randy was able to get some offense in the end, and especially towards you know, when they got to the outside. Uh, Brock Lesnar basically decimated the uh, SmackDown Live announce table by first doing a sort of a running power slam or slamming uh, Randy into it, having Randy going over into the uh, crowd, and then basically grabbing Randy and just tossing him like a sack of potatoes, annihilating the SmackDown announce table. And just when it looked like he was going to do the same thing with the Raw announce table, because he 
roll Randy back in and roll him and then put Randy back out. And again, this wouldn't look like he was going to do the same with the raw announce table. Randy is able to hit an RKO. And Randy got a little offense in after that as they got back into the ring. And when Randy hit the RKO, he just, you know, he sat up with a satisfying grin like, See, I can do that. I can get it out of nowhere on you. And, you know, they get back in the ring. Randy hits his patented uh, DDT. T and everything. And, and then hits another RKO to try to win, but that doesn't help. Help. Elp and decides he's going to go to an old friend of his and gets ready to do the punt, basically, which is put people out with concussions. Instead, uh, Brock hits him, catches him, hits him with the X F5, but Randy kicks out, and that basically is where the match comes to a screeching halt because Brock starts taking off the gloves and starts beating the living crap out of Randy, legitimately to some people knocking him out and busting him up the hard way. According to Ringside News, this is how it was supposed to be planned. I don't know about the knocked out kind of deal, but anyway, legitimately, whether it was storyline or legitimately, he knocked him out, and but he did legitimately bust him up uh, to the point that it had to be the match had to be stopped via TKO. Uh, a lot of people are saying Brian Zane said it. You know, it looked like Brock got his TKO win that he wanted at UFC 200, but he didn't get it there, so WWE gave it to him. And. Uh, then of course Shane McMahon comes in because Brock's not you know not satisfied. He's just keeps pounding and pounding. Even when the doctors try to keep him away, he doesn't want to stop. And Shane McMahon comes in and he gets an F5 for his troubles when he tries to talk Brock out of it, uh, out of stopping. And you know and basically he gets an F like I said he gets an F5 for his troubles. So I don't know if there'll be repercussions on Raw tomorrow night by Shane's sister Stephanie. I don't know. We would think that because that's her brother, even though it's her competition, it's her brother. And, you know, Brock shouldn't have done what he did, not just to Shane, but to Randy. It's going a little too far. I don't know if there'll be repercussions. We'll find out. But uh, overall, though, SummerSlam, you know, a lot of people said kind of ended on a downer, sort of an odd way. I don't really know. You know, it's like, I think what WWE is trying to do is they're trying to create that intrigue. That make that intrigue that makes you want to tune in to see what happens next, and um, we'll just I guess we'll just have to tune in and see what happens. But uh, because I th and I think the reason they did this is because I think WWE is realizing I think WWE is realizing that uh, Raw is not doing so well and SmackDown is doing a little better, so they need to create some intrigue uh, for Monday Night Raw and see what they go from there. But uh, yeah. Just uh, just a decent. I th I thought SummerSlam was okay. You know, it was good. You know, it had its it had its highs. Don't get me wrong. Cena Styles, in my opinion, surprisingly stole the night. So uh, I have to give it a grade of maybe a B, B plus. That that's all I'm gonna say. So let me know what you guys think though about SummerSlam. What you thought of it? Sorry, this was in multiple parts. I'm using my Canon. Uh, uh, my Canon video cam, digital camera with the 60 frames per second, so, <laughs> on 1080p. So let me know what you guys think though down below, what you thought of SummerSlam. What did you think of the matchups overall? And what do you think the repercussions might be tonight at Monday Night Raw for Brock Lesnar? Let me know down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on the Universal Championship. And I'll talk to you all later. God bless. Take care.